I have some objectives for this morning. You may have your own uh, to begin with. I hope that we'll be able to describe two ancient divine rebellions which have lasting consequences to this day. And secondly, you'll be able to define in your own what are the so-called sons of God, who were the Nephilim, what were the giants, who were the Anakim? Hmm. And then thirdly, you'll be able to explain how freedom led to disobedience. Who taught your children to lie? <laughs> Themselves. <laughs> Tell fibs. Take things. Uh, our book states the theme of today's lesson for us. God's own plan for his human family will not be altered or overturned. Eventually, Edom will fill the earth and beyond. So, uh, to put this in a wider context, you can detect at least six rebellions or apostasies that occur in biblical history. The first is that of the serpent in the original garden, resulting in two kinds of offspring in the earth. Those who become loyal to Yahweh, or Jesus Christ, and then those who do not, who become useful to the devil. Secondly, there was the rebellion of uh, the spirits that we'll read about in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, on earth, this resulted in two races on earth. Besides the human beings, there was a new race that began called the Nephilim. We'll talk about what that word means when we come to it. Thirdly, during the time of Abraham, there was another kind of, let's call it a big mistake on the part of Abraham when he gave in to his wife to comply with ancient customs. If your wife had no children, you could have children with another woman and your wife would adopt those children, and which is practiced in many societies to this day. And that resulted in two faiths. The faith of Ishmael, which eventually apostated into Islam, and the faith of Isaac, or biblical faith. But then as the people arrived in the land and established themselves, they were surrounded by idolatrous pagan societies in which one of the principal deities was named Baal. And this resulted in two loyalties. Some Israelites remained loyal to Yahweh, the God of Israel, whilst many others, perhaps the majority of Israelites over time, sided with the local gods. Then we have, in the time of Jesus, the introduction of the dragon. Now the dragon has another identities, which we'll learn, but from the time of the coming of Jesus and the dragon's revolt, there are now two destinies, it's always been there, but it's now much clearer. Everlasting life or everlasting death. Coming up soon, perhaps maybe already started, the revolt of the so-called man of sin, the Antichrist, which is, results in two hopes. One is the hope of the coming kingdom of Messiah Jesus, which should be near, and the other a politically based utopia. Can you think of anyone who's preaching utopian society today? The whole world except for Christians. Just about the whole world except for you. <laughs> and there's, there's probably an administrative reason for cutting off the fuel supply, and fertilizer supplies, and the gas supplies to most of the Western world today. It's to get the world, entire earth ready for a new leftist utopia in which you will own nothing and you will be happy. A second of the divine revolts is reported in Genesis chapter 6, where verses 1 and 2 read, 
when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. The expression sons of God can be translated differently. B'nai Ha'elohim uses a plural form of God, which can have either a singular or a plural meaning. In the latter case, these are sons of the gods, that is, members of the heavenly host, which better suits this context. There are two kinds of beings in this text, both human and divine, or supernatural. This idea of who are the sons of the gods. In Genesis 6-2, we're told that some entities, some personalities or beings, called the sons of God in most translations, but the Hebrew is ambiguous. It can easily mean the sons of the gods, that is, members of a class of divine beings or supernatural beings. As strange as it seems, it's right there in the Bible. And if we're Bible believers, we're stuck with dealing with it. But Bible interpreters have about half a dozen different ways that they deal with this idea of sons of gods. There's the mythical approach which says, well, the Bible simply has adopted the mythology of the surrounding societies. And so it's basically just Near Eastern mythology. If you spend any time on the History Channel, you've heard about the Apkalu, who are seven divine beings known in Assyrian mythology. Over in Sumeria, not Samaria, but Sumeria, uh, they were called the Abgal. And they even are reflected in ancient Jewish writings, including the Book of Enoch, which some of you in this room have been reading. By translation, they're called the Watchers. For all of these, those were gods or semi-gods, demigods, who were able to teach human beings special knowledge. Well, how did women learn to paint themselves up to be attractive? They learned it from the Watchers. How did men learn to make weapons with which to battle and kill each other? From the Watchers. We don't have to believe that because it's not in the Bible, but that was commonly held. Then there's the so-called Sethite view, which says, oh, those sons of God, that just means God believers, those who believe in the true God, especially in the line of lineage of Seth. These were godly men who made the mistake of marrying non-believing women. Go back a couple of generations, all the pastors were afraid that the, the boys in our church would marry loose girls. Uh, but then there are also serious students who say, well, no, this, this is the Cainite view. And these were the descendants of Cain who got mixed up with believing women. And so they used this to scare the Christian girls away from the... Um... Then there's the dynastic view. <laughs> This is the view that what Genesis is talking about is the uh, our ancient kings of the races on earth who began practicing polygamy. It says they took all the women they wanted. And so this was used to, to try to argue against polygamy, which the Bible no place condemns. All right, then there's the, the summary view. In other words, this was just a, in Genesis 6, a summary statement of the, of the preceding chapters indicating that the human race was doing what Yahweh had commanded them to do, which was to multiply and fill the earth. Well, then there's the angelic view, the one that uh, some folk get most concerned with. This is the view that the sons of the gods are fallen spirits who began mingling with human women. Verse 4 relates... The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown, corresponding to the Greek titans. The, term, the Hebrew term Nephilim is translated 
in the Greek Old Testament by the term gigantes, or gigantic ones, men of superior strength as elsewhere in the Bible. It does not mean fallen ones. Were these sons of God begetting a new race as their own imagers? After the flood, enemy tribes of tall folk, such as the Anakim, were said to be Nephilim. God's judgment against this rebellion is revealed in 2 Peter 2.4. God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held in judgment. The Greek Old Testament often translated the phrase sons of God or sons of the gods with the term angels. The New Testament adopts that practice. Jude 6 comments, The angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. There will be further divine rebellions, about which we shall learn later. Uh, Before we come to that, however, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 1. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over all the creatures that move along the ground. Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue. From this verse alone, what can we infer about human free will? That we can rule over the creatures of the earth. Yes, that we, we are to, in obedience to Yahweh, we are to do so. Would there be any possibility of our not doing so? Well, it's an imperative. It appeals to uh, our will. And then uh, be fruitful and increase in number. Okay. However, what could go wrongly? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, have we subdued the earth? We've gone beyond subduing the earth. We've exploited it to the point of ruining our soils <coughs> around the world. Our water supplies are contaminated. Our air is hardly breathable in many countries. I know I've been in Beijing, China, and unable to breathe outside. We add on one more verse. When he said to fill the earth and subdue it, he said the whole earth. What can we infer from this statement about God's plans for the earth that we live on? It would be one thing to multiply and fill Eden, but then the Lord said, I want this for the whole earth. Have kids. Have kids, cover the entire planet, and the original plan was that they were to extend the blessings of Eden throughout the entire planet the future generations would enjoy the blessings of fellowship with God, abundant agriculture, being at peace with all kinds of living creatures, and enjoying intimate fellowship with our Creator. Will that plan ever succeed? Or is it too late? What do you think? It will. It will. When there's a newer. Yeah, there's going to be a newer. On this earth. (laughs) Yeah. God's plan won't be altered. It will not. You know, it's, it doesn't look like it currently. No, but it, but it will. What has to happen first before the earth can become once again Eden with all that prosperity, harmonious life, fascinating things to do forever? Jesus returns. It's going to require some kind of an intervention from heaven, especially since we know that currently the earth is largely ruled by rebellious spirits speaking through rebellious governments approving of everything rebellious we want to do well not everything let's move ahead then to genesis 2 16 and 17. you are free to eat from any tree in the garden but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat from it you will certainly die What can we infer about human free will from these verses? We don't follow directions. (laughs) That's one. They had the choice to eat from the tree. They had a choice whether or not to eat from the tree. Choices have consequences. 
There would be consequences, definitely. You will certainly die. But what could go wrongly? As a preliminary or a tentative approach to draw an inference, could we say that imperfect created beings can and will make wrong choices and eventually may rebel? This seems to be the scenario that the scripture has painted for us that God created us with some of his own attributes. We are created in the image of God to rule, but also in the likeness of God, in that many of his qualities we share. Now, does God have free will? No. <laughs> yes, yeah. I know. All right. <laughs> Who determined God's will for you? We'd have to say that in normal human speech, normal human logic, and the scenarios of scripture, God decides what he will do. According to his nature. Exactly. And part of his nature is his freedom to do that. And he has given us enough freedom to make choices. Now you might say you're so sinful you'll always make the wrong one. We will make wrong choices and many of us will rebel. In fact, we did. As we see Eden originally painted for us, as some suggest, this was God's headquarters for subduing the earth. And this is the place from which we were to go out through the entire planet and to extend the reign of Yahweh. <coughs> Apparently, the earth needed some subduing. If you've ever tried to clear a plot of land that has been neglected for a couple of decades to build on it, you know it requires some subduing. And if you don't keep the wild animal population hunted down, it can become extremely dangerous for human beings. Maybe not where you live, but where Margaret and I used to live, this happens. What beings were present in Eden? This all has to do with subduing the earth. And who's going to subdue it, and who will rule it? All right, who are some of the living beings you can think of? Humans. The human God beings. beings. Okay, that's good. God. Serpent. God. God or the serpent? Let's see, which one did I list? Well, there were the other creatures, the animals, uh, all the beasts, the fish. The serpent was there? And the other? Uh, yes, we're going to add them in a moment. God. <laughs> it is divine counsel. Now, there were other cherubim. Uh, chapter 3, verse 24. Some of them were put in charge of the borders of the garden to keep out, to keep, to keep everyone out after they had disobeyed and been forced out. Possibly, it would be a question in theology, other humanoids. Were there Neanderthal? You know, every few years, our evolutionary biologists make us believe that they have found a new human race that does not belong to Homo sapiens, us. Well, is a possibility. Two verses 14 and 15. <laughs> so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. Right. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Yes, thank you. I'm just saying. Well, we were the livestock and wild animals cursed. Yeah. yeah, it says, this version says, you are accursed above all of the other, all of the animals. It kind of makes them distinct from the other created beings. You know, in, in our minds, we always think it was already a snake when you call it a serpent. Yeah. But here you're showing that lizard man. That's I've never thought about it as in a human form, even though it says now you're going to crawl on your belly. Right. Well, I've never serpent, thought of that. Okay. The serpent wasn't, wasn't really a, a serpent. That's just how he appeared. Mm -hmm. That's our thoughts. But, so uh, that, would, that, would, that would have been Satan. Yeah. So yesterday, Jennifer said she just read an article or, of some creationists who were trying to nail down which variety of serpent or snake it what was, and trying to prove that serpents really do eat dust. But we have an expression in the American language, he bit the dust. <laughs> okay, keep that in mind. This is where it comes from. And how scripture describes the fulfillment of of the eating of dust in the case of the serpent. And then, when did that, or when will that start? At what point does the serpent begin to bite dust? And I will put enmity between you and the woman, 
and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. <laughs> this noun offspring, it's a singular in both languages, and it can mean an individual, and it can also mean many individuals together. So my offspring currently consists of seven, but any one of them is also my offspring. And scripture actually uses that fact of language to talk sometimes about Israel and other times about a singular person, Messiah. So, uh, he will crush your head and he, he will strike your heel. Do you have any idea what this is referring to? What event? That they'll, they'll be fighting against one another. Uh, there would be a strife, yes, uh, between the, the two offspring, but eventually one of the offspring is going to crush the serpent. Come on in, folks. First, who is the woman's offspring? Jesus. Eventually, it will be Jesus. And, of course, it's all human beings. Adam named her Eve, which means life, because she would be the mother of all human beings. But then, it's also, there are three passages of Scripture that came to my mind. Matthew 1, 6, Mary, the mother of Jesus, or who was the Messiah. And Galatians 4, 4, at the proper time, he came forth born of a woman, or born of woman, we can say in English, which fulfills the prediction. And then in Revelation 12, 5, which you'll have to look at shortly, uh, the woman brings forth a son who will be eventually Lord of all the earth. Well, a little more difficult, who are the serpent's offspring? Since spirits, as far as we know, cannot reproduce. All of them are disobedient to God. Let's think of some examples in Scripture, specifically. Cain, Cain was one of those. First John 3.12, Cain was of the evil one. John 6.70, well, in 8.44 he says of the unbelievers, you are of your father the devil. This becomes then a, a, a scriptural concept that Satan has offspring who are suborn humans. Humans turned bad. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon, under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads yeah. and ten horns right. and seven crowns on its head. Yeah. Heads. Some astronomers, uh, professional and amateur, five years ago were quick to point out that just such a sign appeared in the sky in the constellations of Virgo and Leo, the Virgin and the Lion, which are right next to Draco, the, the dragon. But there was also another point in history when the same constellation of stars and planets occurred. When was that? The wise men. The 3 the BC. The wise men. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There are, right. And in fact, because of what we call retrograde motion, mm -hmm. the planet Jupiter actually went into Virgo, did a couple of spins, came back out, nine months later, came back in, all the stars lined up, the 12, the 12 planets and stars over the head of uh, Virgo. And that became, in antiquity, one of the Christian proofs that Jesus must have been the Messiah. So John actually conserved, in the book of Revelation, an actual sign that everyone reading the book at the time would have recognized, yep, it really happened. Reason for which the wise men came from the east, because they had seen that in the sky. Um, let's talk a little more about the dragon. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the na nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And the sign in the heavens now turns to history. A picture in the, for all to see becomes real historical events. 
this dragon swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Now, there is a common evangelical belief that one third of all the angels followed Satan. And they've gone to this verse to try to prove it. But it says nothing about these angels turning back. There was a war in the heavens. And it was so fierce that even some of the good angels were knocked out of their position. Of course, eventually they returned. With them out of the way, the dragon was then poised to destroy the child that the woman was about to bear. Bear is the child, one who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Why would the dragon be so concerned about this human eventually ruling over all the nations? Because his head's going to get stepped on like back in Genesis. Because the fallen spirits are seeking to rule all the nations and to subdue the world for themselves, and even to make of the, the dragon's offspring their own imagers, those who reflect the glory of this dragon, whom we will identify shortly. Uh, meanwhile, her child is snatched up to God and to his throne. Have we figured out yet who the child is? <laughs> so when did these events occur? Acts 1. Yeah, Acts chapter 1. So Satan thought he had won the battle when he got Messiah crucified. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Have you figured out yet who this, what the serpent is? It's, it's right. the yeah. yeah, okay, right. Many biblical scholars, they're not sure that Satan is the devil or that the devil is the serpent because in the Hebrew Bible, the equation is never made. And my Jewish commentary is pretty good on most points definitely makes, uh, takes a dig at the Christians for trying to equate those various beings as being the same person in this verse. However, that was you could do that until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and much of the Second Temple Jewish literature that's been translated in the last few, few decades in which the Jewish community itself was already making that equation. And so when the Christians adopted that, they felt it was, uh, it was a true understanding. So, what was the serpent of Genesis 3? He's the devil, Satan, the dragon. Interesting verse, Isaiah 27, 1, speaking of a future time. In that day, Yahweh will punish with his sword, his fierce, great, and powerful sword, Leviathan, the gliding serpent. Same word as used in Genesis uh, chapter 3. Leviathan, the coiling serpent. He will slay the monster of the sea. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, the term here for monster is dragon. Same Greek word. And since the New Testament was written in Greek and usually quotes the Greek Old Testament, rather than translating the Hebrew, we find that here's the equation already present. So when John chose to talk about a dragon, which also fit the astronomy of the day, he had biblical basis for doing so. It's the same word that's also used at the end of Job, when God interrogates Job. Yes. We come to the book of Isaiah, and to deal more with the divine Rebellion. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Right. Now this is Isaiah talking centuries before the event of Satan's being cast down actually happened, which was at the time of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So from that time, Satan is pretty well bound to operating in the earth. Once laid low, but possibly 
a prediction of the yet future time when Satan will be cast into the pit. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will rise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly and on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. Do you recognize any phrases in that verse that we've seen before? I will ascend to the heavens. I will ascend to the heavens? The assembly. The mount of assembly. And where was that located? That was in Eden. <coughs> And that was where Yahweh and his divine council had their headquarters. He also calls it here the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. Our earlier version said the heights of the north. We used to wonder what is that talking about? Well, heights usually refers to high land, and the, name, the word for north happens to be Zaphon. But Zaphon is also the name of a well-known mountain on the border between Syria and today's Turkey. Remember, it's not Turkey anymore, it's Turkey. Erdogan decided he didn't like his country being named after a bird. <laughs> so, now, this text, however, is addressed to the king of Babylon, according to verse 4, and Satan is never named in it. But who, who or what is being depicted in this passage? The best we can say is that God was taunting the king of Babylon by describing a divine rebellion that was analogous to what that king was doing. In other words, he was treating himself as though he were Satan trying to take over the world. Let's not let the Bible detractors try to, to fool us. And one of the things that Bible scholars hate most is to be classed with preachers. Because preachers open up to Isaiah 14 and say, this is talking about Satan. And they look at it and say, no it's not. It's talking about the king of Babylon. He's talking to the king of Babylon, but he's using the language of the divine rebellion. And from this language, we understand that this is the kind of thing that rebellious spirits do, in particular, the one whom we call Satan, yeah. Well, doesn't Babylon usually symbolize the world system it, of government and politics? And eventually, yes, because of these passages. At this time, however, it was literal Babylon. I will ascend upon the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Right. Now the depths of the pit, the underworld. The term dust, Yahweh said to the serpent, you will eat dust, you will bite dust. That word dust, if you look it up in your concordance, is usually related to the dust of the grave, the place of the dead. And so Satan now is destined to eat to bite dust. I find it interesting that he said he would make himself like the most high God. <clears throat> yes. But we, but we as humans have been made like the most high God. <laughs> Indeed, he wanted to be more, he was already an imager, that's the way he was made, but he wanted to be more. He wanted to claim his authority, not just, not just be like him. That's right, good point, excellent. All right, now let's jump over to Ezekiel. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. All right, this also was addressed to the king of Tyre, according to verse 11. So who or what is depicted in this passage? We make that application to Satan, but it's a description again of a divine rebellion. So this is a creature who dwelt in on the Mount of the Assembly in the presence of Yahweh. In fact, a guardian cherub himself, who then claims prerogatives that don't belong to him. Originally blameless, so which brings a question to some people's mind, what made him go bad? Yes. Is, is this speaking to just one person? That are you, you know, can do various things? 
Well, the passage was addressed to one person, the king of Tyre, which was a, a city at the time. Yeah. Uh, we know that. And we, we presume that the, the imagery concerns one particular cherub, mm -hmm. whom we now identify as the Satan, or the devil, or the dragon. We've read before in the, you know, in the other chapters, God created all the gods. He yeah. called them the gods. Right. So, I mean, even though he's talking to the king, I think he's getting to the point, right. you know, of, of this Jesus, because he was originally, when he was created, it was blameless, but then turned evil as he was the, he, as he was the leader of the rebellion. Maybe the leader of the rebellion, because the dragon did, was cast down with his angels. Through your widespread widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Well, the last verse in this one, they both mentioned fiery stones. The fiery stones, yes. Uh, in antiquity, fiery stones were equated with the stars. And the stars were equated with divine beings. And so you get this language of fiery stones, stars, divine beings. In other words, you were among the spirit beings. What does widespread trade refer to? It sounds as though he was running a business. <laughs> His business is violence. Yeah. Okay, yeah, he was very busy. As a, as a guardian cherub, he had work to do. Especially in his trade with the human beings. In his interactions with the human race, uh, he's filled with violence. And of course, to sum up his position, he has sinned. He was a spirit world, Al Capone. <laughs> <laughs> what was the serpent's crime? A divine rebellion. And what was the penalty? Expelled. He's expelled from Eden. Will he have a part in the future Edenic? Uh, no. He's expelled. You know what baffles me is, um, in the, the part on page 42, it said, uh, the fact that God knows the future doesn't mean it's predestined. Yeah. The yeah. fact that God created Satan as a cherub, as a divine being, you know, he, he knew ahead of time he was going to do what he was going to do, but yeah. yet he okay. didn't have control over it. Yeah, all right. You are so sharp. <laughs> Did God need evil to have No. No. It, it, was there something in his nature that required evil? No. No. From eternity past, he was content when there was no evil. Yes. Yeah. Did God foreordain evil? Yes. Some theologies demand yes. Since but he knows everything, everything, yes, he probably knew it was going to happen. That is, he do something to make sure it would happen. There are theologies that actually say that. Because of free will? Yeah. Uh, no, because there is no free will, according to that theology. Did God prod an angel to become the devil? Did God trick Satan into it? As far as we know, he did. It was something that he invented himself. Did God predestine Adam to disobey him? He set him up. He set him up? I think. I mean, he gave him up. He was here for free will. Okay. And now here's your choice. All right. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. God didn't have to manipulate the circumstances to push him into it. But when the opportunity was there, he made a wrong choice, for sure. But we do not believe uh, from Scripture. You might from theology argue that God predestined this. But I don't think you can from Scripture. Did God know that evil could happen? Yeah. Well, sure. But we know that he is eternal not only forever in the past and at the current time, he's also in the future. Because all this, everything happens in him. If God gives real free will to his creatures, then is his sovereignty diminished? Is he now less God because we can do something he did not make us do? He's more God because he wants us to do him. Good point. There's something now that he can do. Some argue that didn't have to do it this way, but God knowing, go, moving through the future, uses the fact of rebellion and sin by judging it, redeeming creatures through repentance, so that he has now dealt with evil for the rest of eternity. By, let, by letting it happen, he dealt with it. 
No, we don't think. In fact, my argument is that by allowing evil, something was introduced into the creation that he himself did not cause, and that is chaos, that which is uncontrolled. It is not subject to his command, but he's able to deal with it. Will God be able to restore and increase Eden to the entire planet? Yes. Yes. yes, that's the plan. This is what he's going to do, what he's begun to do with us.